grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. And peace, let's pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for salvation, let's pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the will be church and God, and for the unity of all, let's pray to the Lord. You shall not steal. You shall not covet. 
and he and other come here are so of this word. Love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. Besides this, you know what time it is. What time it is, how it is now the moment for you to wait for sin. For our salvation is near to us now that we became believers. The night is far gone, the day is near. Let us then lay aside the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us live honorably as in the day, not in revealing, reviling in drunkenness, not in debauchery and licentiousness. Not in quarreling and jealousy. Instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. God. So, I want to be honest, when I think about the readings that we just did, I get a little nervous. These are not maybe the first ones that I'd like to preach on my first time visiting someplace. In many of the circles that I run, Christians might have a reputation for sometimes being a little bit judgmental. I don't know if anybody's ever heard about that. Sometimes that's out there. Um, I have noted in my own experience that we tend to be especially rough with Christians who don't think, believe, or worship, or maybe even vote, uh, the same way that we do. Right? That happens. That's true. I think it's important to name that on the front end before we delve in. So I'm a little bit nervous up here. I don't know you all yet. Uh, so I'll just, I'll just tell you. But uniformity is not the goal of the body of Christ, right? Uh, arms and eyes and ears and backs and all that. We are different members doing different things on purpose, just as it should be. Rather, unity in working together, right? We are all doing God's work 
Uh, maybe not all of us are hands, maybe some of us are eyes or thumbs or ears or what have you. Part of the movement of redeemed human beings, simultaneously sinners and saints, our tradition tells us, is that we need to be, from time to time, corrected. We all kind of go the wrong way sometimes. Um, I, you know, I don't really need to illustrate that. I, uh, we, uh, we got up early this morning, and I wasn't as kind with my middle son as I could have been, I'll just say. So the readings for this week explain why we would want to help each other out, and why correction is actually kind of loving. So from the reading from Ezekiel that Eric did, it presents correction as a way to love each other. God said to the prophet, look, if I tell you that sin leads to death, and you don't warn people, it is as if you killed them. If the prophet does warn them, however, and they still sin, they alone are responsible for their choices. But there's a third option, that we would take the warning seriously and change behavior. And this, at first, doesn't even seem possible to the people Ezekiel's talking to. How can anybody do the right thing? Uh, verse 10 of chapter 33 says, Surely our offenses and sins are upon us, and we are rotting away in them. How can we survive? Well, frequently, the answer to despair, especially in the Bible, is God. God gives this beautiful self-revelation about God's own internal experience. God wants the people to know that, look, I don't take any pleasure or derive any benefit from the destruction of the wicked. God loves humans. God wants to save everybody. God takes pleasure when people turn and choose a loving, holy path. God does not give up on those, but continually desires that we would turn and embrace God's grace, given first before we repent, and then live accordingly, live in that love that God first shows us. Then turning to the Gospels, Jesus tells his disciples how to embrace grace and live accordingly by offering a path towards repentance. First, before we dig into that, though, we need to recognize the context of the words I just read. Jesus has just told, immediately before we started reading, the parable of the one lost sheep that we love. This sheep wanders off. It's not lost. It doesn't forget how to read a map. The sheep is with all the other 99 sheep and wanders off. And what does the good shepherd do but leave the 99? and go bring back that one sheep that has wandered away. God is passionate about recovering those who walk away. Right after this section that I just read, this you'll read next week, Jesus will discuss with Peter the limits, or lack thereof, about how many times to forgive somebody. You know, I, I don't want to step on the toes of whoever's speaking next week, but. Uh, Peter will ask, how many times do we need to forgive? Seven? Which actually seems like a lot. I've, I've forgiven people less than seven times. I don't know about anybody else. And Jesus says, no, 70 times seven, or 77 times, or 490 times, depending on how you answer. The point is that this passage that we talk about today in the Gospel is literally surrounded by expressions of limitless grace, whether it's going after the lost sheep, or multiplying numbers of time to forgive somebody, right? God does not give up on people ever. And we need to keep that context centered when we discuss the process for approaching somebody who sins, okay? That was all disclaimer. That's the front matter. Now we actually talk about the thing. If somebody sins, Jesus advises a private and discreet approach 
to someone who sins. Now, in our earliest and best manuscripts of the Greek New Testament, against you is not present in Matthew 18. So the text says, if someone sins, go and approach that person, even if it's not against you. If somebody hurts somebody else in our midst, we're all obligated to speak up and say, look, that hurt somebody else. The victim is not required to be the only one who addresses the person who hurt her or him. Instead, anybody who knows, that person may approach the perpetrator one-on-one, -on -one don't make a big deal about it. Don't go crazy right away. But speak to that person, taking her or him aside and saying, look, that thing that you did hurt somebody. And that hurts all of us. This arrangement takes seriously the personhood, safety, and dignity of the sinner as well as the victims, right? We don't want to embarrass somebody right off the bat. That's not what's called for. Size but a couple times in the reading. Well, there are some reversals. If the person who sinned listens to the other person who confronts them, wonderful. You've recovered your brother, the Greek text says. Siblings have been reconciled. Families are made whole. Well, look, I did the wrong thing. You told me about it. Great, I want to do the right thing. Right? That's how a body works together. If I have a pain in my shoulder, which I just happened to, um, I nurse it. I don't uh, throw the left-handed balls like I used to. I take it easy. I listen. It's telling me that there's some pain. I repent. I change my ways. I try to throw right-handed. Okay? That's good. That's what it's supposed to look like. A little bit of uh, information about hurt is good for the whole body. But it doesn't always work. If not, if the hurt does not listen to you, an increasing number of witnesses confront the person. First two or three more. If that person chooses to not care about the sins that hurt the community, they are to be treated as someone outside of the fellowship. Now, you have to understand what's going on here. I've done a thing that hurt somebody, and somebody else comes to me and says, look, you hurt somebody, and I say, eh, I'm not really going to make a change. And then two or three more people come to me, and they say, look, no, you really hurt somebody. This thing that you did was wrong. And I say, it's cool that you all think so, but I'm not going to change. And then the entire community comes together and says, look, you are hurting the body of Christ with that thing you did. We would love for you to make a change. We care about you. We care about the body. We need to work together to make this right. And then I still say no. No. I hear all the things that you all are united in saying about how my action harms people. I'm not going to change. It is only then that the person is treated like a Gentile or a tax collector. If someone is not moved when confronted by an ever larger community number about how they injure others, such a person is not ready to be a mature member of the body of Christ. The members of the body of Christ must care for the other parts. We also have to reflect on how does Jesus treat Gentiles and tax collectors? He says, I'm never going to talk to you, and you're out. I can't believe how that works. No, pretty much the exact opposite of that. He hangs out with them. Jesus is always accused of, wait, why are you dying with sinners and tax collectors? Why are you talking to the serial Canaanite woman? Why are you talking to the centurion? Why are you interacting with these people? Jesus doesn't give up on folks. Jesus says, look, you maybe need some special attention. Maybe you're not ready to be part of the whole community. I didn't happen to see you at the temple. Maybe we need to talk. 
Treating like Gentiles and tax collectors in this passage is not, oh, we're never going to talk to those people. It's, oh, we have to talk to those people. We have to figure out a way to make it right because they matter too, right? They're not necessarily ready for the full community, but we don't give up in love on anyone. Think about how Jesus treats tax collectors. That's what the instruction is. Treat them like Gentiles or tax collectors. And we know what Jesus thinks of them. Friends, we are, our Lutheran tradition tells us, simultaneously saints and sinners. We have been, I have been, even this morning, on both sides of this thing. I told my one child to not hit the other child. Saint. Um, I wasn't as nice to my middle son when he woke up my wife who could have used another hour of sleeping as uh, I could have been a sinner. We need reproach. We need to talk to folks and say, look, we're hurting the body. We're on both sides of this. We don't get to say, oh, I'm only this or oh, I'm only that. This is advanced community care. This is what the body of Christ does, right? We are going to go out into the community. I see several yellow shirts. To love people with our hands, with our energy, with our skills, with the things that we know to do and make things right. Good. Good. Also, when somebody comes to us and says, look, there's this other thing I need you to make an opportunity to. And when we see somebody hurting somebody else, or when badly it's us, that's another opportunity to make things right with our hands, with our lives, with our skills, because God has been gracious with us. Not because we're trying to be righteous, or we're trying to save ourselves, or we think we can do anything in our own power. No, far from that but because we are simultaneously saints and sinners whom God has saved. We need the body of Christ, both here as we will celebrate it in a little bit, and here as we embody it. Not confronting folks when they sin is not loving or gracious. It's an abdication of responsibility. But we always stay grounded in the loving character of God, who's not ever wished to condemn and takes great pains, even on the cross, to reconcile and to save. I'm told the first step is admitting there's a problem. When there is a problem, we admit it to each other as siblings in Christ, as brothers and sisters, and say, hey, there's an issue we can work on it together because God gives us love and power and grace to do it. God in God's grace stands ever ready to redeem when we admit that we need to turn back. That's the good news. We get to work together with God to help the body of Christ.
catechism, let's profess our faith with the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, Creator and Savior. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified and died in his bed. He descended to the dead. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of the everlasting. Prayer position response to merciful God is receive our prayer. Remembering the caring and generous works of God, we pray for the church, the creation, and the needs of our neighbors. Hold us accountable, God. Show your church where repentance is needed, and lead us in paths of intentional compassion and listening. Help us extend hands of reconciliation and care especially in relationships with other Christians and people of other faiths. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Reveal your, your miracles to us, O oh God. Move us to cherish you as we behold the wonders of creation. Renew the seas and the soil, the forests and the creatures that live in you. Turn us to ways of living that seek earth thriving, earth thriving. Merciful God, this is our prayer. Inspire us to lead with honor, O oh God. Guide judges and legislators, police and government officials to create and uphold just laws. Move us to treat all people with dignity and guide our conversation with one another. Merciful God, this is our prayer. Help us comfort those who suffer, O oh God. Reassure any who are harmed by the wicked acts of others. Bring peace to all who are marveled, frightened, despairing, or sick, especially those that are prayerless and in the homes. Guard their waking in their sleep. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Awaken us, O oh God, to challenge and encourage people to value the vocation to which, are, to which each is called. We pray for all discerning new possibilities or changing employments. In all our diverse callings, teach us to love our neighbor above all else. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Be our hope, O oh God, we remember with thanksgiving your disciples who died in faith. May their trust in your promise be our protection and our hope. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Remember us according to your steadfast love as we offer these and the prayers of our heart, trusting in your compassion made known through Jesus Christ. Amen. The peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Blessed are you, O God, maker of all things, for your goodness you have blessed us with these gifts. 
ourselves, our time, and our possessions. Use us in what we have gathered and redeem the world with your love. For the one who gave himself for us, Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also, also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks to praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior Jesus Christ, who on this day overcame death and the grave, and by his glorious resurrection opened to us the way of everlasting life, and so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host in heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. <laughs>
us pray. God will bring us with his bread of life and cup of salvation. You have united us with Christ and make us one of our people. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Receive this blessing. May the God of steadfastness and encouragement grant you harmony with one another in accordance with Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing, so that you may abound in hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. May the God of all grace bless you now and forever. Amen. And here an extra blessing for God's work our hands on. Amen. Holy One, as we serve others today, give us courage to see you in our neighbor. Give us strength to sustain us in our work and give us more opportunities to continue your work in our community. As we serve others today with this collection of school supplies and backpacks for the Lutheran World Relief Ministry, we ask your blessing on those who will receive and on those whom you have given. As we give our hands in service for your work, help us to trust in your mercy for those who are still in need. Amen. Announcements for the good of the order. Yes. Tuesday, nine o'clock, night by the breakfast. Fantastic. Where? Okay. There's a card back on the table. I need to give you the sign that it's for the meeting. And Dave, how to do it? I can't borrow it. How's Martha? What are you doing? <laughs> the other part of it is. She's not doing well. She's in, she's in pain because they had to remove some bone. And uh, she'll make it though. She's getting better all the time. Please sign the card on the table for her and you take that home to her. Okay. I will. And secondly, today is God's work our hands, as we all already know. And if we don't just stay and help us for first, I think you'll lose God. He's wonderful. Can I just say, as a point of personal privilege, uh, two things. It's been a joy to be with y'all today. And then I have been in the countries where uh, Lutheran World Relief distributes these supplies, and they are treasure. Uh, so I just want to say thank you for what you're doing. It really matters to folks. Thank you.
to love and serve your neighbor, and to be God's hands in the world. We go forth today and every day surrounded and supported by the love of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. By the grace of God, we have come to worship and to serve. Go in peace, we share the good news. Thanks be to God. Thank you.